All right, could I get a hands up if one of the things that radicalized you was the women's oppression? Yeah, that's basically was one of the things that also radicalized me. Um, I felt so angry about constantly seeing sexism, discrimination, inequality, violence and harassment towards women. And obviously we know that this is a huge problem. Globally, almost one in three have been subjected to physical or sexual violence at least once in their lifetime. And in 2021, uh, there was around 45,000 women and girls who were killed by an intimate partner or family members. And many women, as we know, they're struggling to leave abusive relationships because of they are economic depending on them. And a big part of that is, of course, the pay gap. Globally, women earn an average of 16% less than men. And it's estimated to take 257 years until you can actually close that pay gap around the world. At the same time, across the world, women and girls are performing more than three quarters of all the unpaid domestic care and work. Um, and it's not only a question about trying to fight for reforms that would benefit women, but also just defending the ones that we have won in the past. Last year, as I think everyone is aware, the US Supreme Court, they overturned the case of Roe versus Wade, making it possible for states to basically ban abortions. Um, so how do we fight the oppression of women? How do we end it? Millions of people all around the world are asking themselves this question and is drawing ever more radical conclusions from it. Uh, and this was the case for me, like back in 2014, a few months before I met the International Marxist Tendency, I had joined the Left Party uh, and its youth organization. I had previous before that come across some Marxist theories. I wanted to know more about it and I wanted to specifically know more about its approach um, to fighting oppression. So I was very surprised when I joined the left party and discovered their views on Marxism and the approach to women oppression. Because according to the left party, Marxism is only useful when you study class society but not patriarchy. And they argue that Marxism cannot explain why women are being subordinated uh, to men. The, uh, Marxism cannot explain the division of labor that arises between sexes, the role of unpaid work, and therefore we need feminism to understand and fight oppression. And as I said, feminism, it claims that women's oppression is based on patriarchy, the structure of men dominance uh, over women, which they say is not completely relying on class society. And many radical feminists, they think that patriarchy is rooted in reproduction. And this boils down really to biological determinism, that the idea that your behaviors uh, is rooted in purely biological traits amongst humans. The left party, they claim that uh, patriarchy is rooted in reproduction. Uh, and it has existed in all kinds of societies to preserve uh, the political and economic power within a tribe, a clan, a family, and a household. And the only conclusion that you can draw from this is that men are naturally aggressive towards women. You also have the liberal feminists who understand oppression as a result of very unfortunate um, ideas and norms, and the struggle therefore against oppression is to struggle against you know, people who have oppressive ideas and try to convince them to stop doing these behaviors, stop having these oppressive um, ideas. And they are idealists, which means that they view society as a consequence from the ideas, morals, norms that people have. Now, Marxists, we don't believe that uh, men has a biological trait to make them hate women. We don't think that oppression is just a result of a set of reactionary ideas that humans are either just born with or fell through from the sky, uh, or that it solely comes down to the fact that women are able to reproduce. They don't 
uh, we don't obviously deny that it is, uh, exists, you know, ideas and gender norms, etc. But the question is, where does these ideas come from? Now, Marx says life is not determined by consciousness, but consciousness by life. It means that our morals, our philosophy, our thoughts, our norms, they don't drop from the sky, but they are a result uh, because they are shaped from society. It needs uh, and its history of development. And by using the method of historical materialism when studying history, we can learn that the oppression of women, um, classes, the state, it has not always existed. For 97 to 99% of humans' existence, um, we have lived in relatively egalitarian uh, hunter-gatherer societies. And in Engels' very famous work, The Origins of the Family, Private Property and the State, he shows that the family, human relationships to one another, and societies are constantly undergoing a process of development throughout history. And Engels and Marx, they base themselves off on uh, Lewis Henry Morgan's text, Asian Society. And Morgan, he explained that uh, he thought it was possible to understand basically how human society as a whole evolved uh, by looking at different societies at different stages and comparing them to one another. And by doing this, he developed a theory about social evolution. And he explained that human societies across the world, they go through similar stages of development uh, and that it is a direction of, of a process from less to more developed forms. Now, Morgan, he divided human societies into three different stages, which he called savagery, barbarism and civilization. And within these stages, you had lower, middle and upper levels. And it was the development of technique, of tools, uh, which moved humanity from one stage to another. And today we call these um, stages the, the, the Paleolithic uh, ages, which is where humans are living as hunter-gatherers. Uh, you then have the Neolithic age, which is where humans start to discover agriculture, settle down, work on the land. And then what Morgan calls civilization is the Bronze Age, where you have the development of more urban civilization and class societies. Now, Morgan, he was limited to the scientific levels of the mid 19th century, but the essence of what he said, the human society, including the family, goes through stages from lower to higher based on a development of techniques. Uh, it is correct. Uh, basically, the changes within the family is linked to the development of the productive forces. And he argued that the idea of the family has been a growth through successive stages of development in which monogamy is only the last in its series of forms. Now, Morgan, he thought that human uh, societies, they must have started off from a stage where inbreeding was uh, normal. And at a certain stage, human realized that this is not very good and it's a bit dangerous. Uh, so you started to see a, uh, uh, an involvement of more complicated mating networks to avoid inbreeding. Now, during the Paleolithic uh, age, the development of group marriage uh, within hunter-gatherers starts to emerge. Um, and this is where you see alliance between different clans were being established where individuals could select a partner from another group, basically. And these partners, they were not tied to each other for life. And it was also common to have several partners, basically. Um, both men and women could very easily, you know, break up or free from a relationship and start another, etc. Uh, and these hunter-gatherers, these societies, they tended to be matrilocal. And it meant that the women that was born into a clan, they tended to stay there uh, together with their sisters, their mothers and cousins, etc. The men that they would uh, mate with would come from a different clan. And recent studies have shown that uh, it confirms because you have found like DNA that support this. Later on during the Neolithic age, you have the existence of pairings and, and couples. And this is not how we, for example, see marriage today. Uh, these pairings, they were mutual decisions and separations was an option for both parties. 
And it's under this stage as well in history where you have the development of the Gens, uh, which was based on the matrilineal kinship. Uh, but the existence of pairings, of couples, did prepare the ground for monogamy and the future nuclear family later on. Uh, now Morgan, he came to his conclusions on the basis of his field work that he did amongst the Iroquois and other indigenous people in Americas. Uh, and this field work gave him a glimpse to what the early human society might have looked like. For example, he saw that women uh, amongst the Iroquois, they were very uh, much more equal than what it was in the so-called civilized world. Um, and so when you have these people that lived as hunter-gatherers, you had big family groups living together um, with the children that was born into the clan were taking care of everyone. It did not matter that you did not know the biological father to the children. And observations from the 17th centuries made by Western traders and missionaries uh, of the native people Montaganis Nascabi uh, in, in, in Canada, uh, it confirms basically Engels and Morgan's theory of the family. Because in the 17th centuries, these, mon uh, these native people, uh, they lived as Elgarian hunter-gatherers, and the women within these groups were very respected. The family relations uh, amongst the Gens were matrilineal, uh, and all the children that was born into the group were taken care uh, collectively. And in one of these observations that you can read uh, from these uh, missionaries, you have an indigenous father saying to one of the French uh, you see missionaries, he says, you French, you only love your own children, but we love all the children of the tribe. And this shows that uh, women's oppression is not based on reproduction because pr in pre-class societies, child rearing was communal and women were being treated as equals. And the matrilineal uh, descent amongst human, um, uh, amongst the hunter-gatherers was part of the reasons why women had an equal role uh, within the clan. But it also comes down to the egalitarian uh, nature of, of this group. Now, what was this based on? As I said, there was uh, no classes, uh, there was no state that existed in these uh, uh, hunter-gatherers groups. No one owned the land, uh, no one owned productive forces or, 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 or property. And Marx and Engels, they described this stage as primitive communism uh, because there was no concept of private property and, and, and private ownership. Most of the days were just spent trying to search and collect food, living from hand to mouth. And humans were completely depending on each other to survive. And even if there had been selfish people during this stage who wanted to appropriate a surplus, there was usually nothing to spare, basically. It was absolutely necessary to share the food within the tribe completely equally uh, with every single member. Uh, and it meant that you could not have a material base for classes or privileges or elites. Again, you see this amongst, uh, amongst the Montaganis and Nascapis, um, because they had no formal leaders within the tribe, and the social ethic uh, in the group was generosity, cooperation, and patience. You had one missionary who said that the people uh, in, this, in this tribe have good humor, lack of jealousy, and a willingness to help out. Uh, those who do not contribute uh, their share are not respected. Instead, in these hunter-gatherer societies, production and distributions in, uh, were, were carried out in the common, where both men and women were taking decisions. It does appear, though, that there is a certain divi division uh, of labor between men and women in the daily work. When women became pregnant or had small children, they spent a lot of time collecting roots, food, um, uh, berries, etc. did work that was closer to the community, uh, like childcare, uh, but also making tools and weapons for the clan. The men, on the other hand, they were a bit more able to, to do the hunting. However, this does not um, uh, affect the position between men and women within the tribe. The hunting was not always reliable. You could have bad luck, basically, and come home without anything. It was the gathering of berries, roots, nuts, 
uh, they usually brought most of the food to the clans. And it meant that men and women contributed equally to the survival. But after the Neolithic revolution, a lot of things started to change. For the first time in human history, you see the development of new tools, domestications of animals, development of agriculture, and it allowed humans to produce, not just to meet the basic needs of the day, but to create enough to have a surplus. So basically, the division that you have seen in pre-class society, it became much more extreme now. Um, with the adoption of agriculture, you saw the rise of birth uh, rates, basically, that increased. And, and that also had uh, an increased childcare responsibility on women. The men, that they prim primarily worked on the livestock and agriculture, and the women did mainly the work that was, uh, you know, the, the, the task that was close to the home, childcare, cooking, etc. Um, however, it was, you know, the work that was carried out by men that produced the surplus. So the surplus fell into the hands of men. And now men and women did not no longer contribute equally to the survival. And this process steadily meant that women became to be seen as inferior to men as it was from the work that the men did that produced a surplus. Still, when a man died, the, the, uh, the surplus that he had produced, it would not stay within his new family, but would go back to his mother again, basically. And as men did the work to produce and control the surplus, it led to greater desire to trace the inheritance through the male line. And the creation of an ever-growing surplus also meant to that private uh, uh, property and classes began to uh, emerge. But to trace the inheritance through the male line, it would require the uh, enforcement of female monogamy. And therefore, the line of inheritance had to be for forcefully shifted from the mother's to the father's side. And this here where we see the origins of marriage, of the patriarchal family, and this transition took place um, at some point between the start of agriculture and the rise of the first class society, roughly five to 6,000 years ago. Uh, and it happened independently in many parts of the world, like Mesopotamia, uh, South America, and China, South Asia, uh, and other parts of Sub-Sahara. And Morgan, he explained that after houses, lands, flock, herds, and great exchangeable commodities became so great in quality and head, held by individual ownership, the question of their inheritance became much more important. And the family, this is now where you start to see how it's breaking up into smaller patriarchal nuclear units with strict monogamy for women to assure that the children that she birthed was really her husband's, basically, and that they would have the asserted right to, um, uh, to, to inherit the property of their deceased father. Now, Engels explains that the emergence of the patriarchal family represent the world historic defeat for the female sex. He said, the man took command in the home, women were degraded, reduced to servitude, she became a slave to his lust and a mere <coughs> instrument to produce children. So since the emergence of class society, it has been the men who has done uh, predominantly the, 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 the participated in production and provided food and economic stability to the family. Women, on the other hand, were literally seen as property, isolated within the family, and her only task was really to produce children to her husband. And therefore, she became financially dependent on her husband to survive. And in order for a man to control her children, basically, the husband had to control women uh, and, and his wife sexually, basically. And we can see this in Asian Greece, where women were forcibly kept inside 24-7 to eliminate the risk of making sure that her offspring was not from someone else, basically. Um, if she was raped, she was seen as damaged goods. And the person who did rape her, um, he had to pay for his damage to either her husband or her father. 
And families, uh, they could, you know, just give women away and sell them as wives without consulting them. It was at this point as well where you see uh, prostitution to, to become a, uh, to emerge. Uh, because as women were completely removed from production, women from the poorest social classes were forced in order to survive to sell the only commodity that they had, uh, their bodies. And moreover, Engels points out that while wives had to obey strict monogamy, prostitution was another mean for men to continue with um, polygamy, basically. Uh, sexualized violence, men's power over women, has since the emergence of private property, its origins in, you know, keeping women financially independent, uh, financially dependent on a man, being his property where he controlled her body and her children. So as what we can clearly see is that the oppression is inherent in class society. So the fight against women's oppression must be linked to the struggle against, against class society and capitalism. But many feminists, they would say that, well, men would never willingly give up, uh, you know, to fight, uh, to, to, uh, to oppress women because they have a material interest in keeping it. For example, Heidi Hartman, who wrote The Unhappy Marriage of Marxism and Feminism, believes that all men benefit from controlling women because they receive personal services uh, within the home, like cooking, cleaning, taking care of the kids, the elderly, uh, sexual services, etc. And because that women are the ones who's doing the, most of the domestic work, men also have more time for leisure, basically, uh, which they, which she say they would not give up, basically. And she says that men as a group maintain this control by excluding women from access of essential productive resources. Uh, now Hartman, she's conflating how men and women are socially to act uh, with the objected material interests of a working class man have. Just because that we are socialized in certain gender forms, uh, gender roles, it does not mean that men have in their you know, material interest and interest to uphold these norms and uphold this oppression. The gender roles that we see today, they, you know, where, where men are viewed as providers, women as caring mothers, etc., they are rooted in class society because that, that has been the roles that, that men and women have had for thousands of years in class societies. Um, but does that mean that men as a group benefit from women's domestic work or that men, for example, earn less than, than, uh, than or that the women earn less than men? And it's really easy, obviously, to get angry about all the injustices, to get angry about discrimination, inequality towards women. But we cannot let that anger fool us into thinking that men as a group are the root problem. Now, Marxism it is a science. We don't look at the surface of things and draw moralistic conclusions from it, but we try to undercover the, the real material interest, the, the reasons why, for example, we have gender norms and why we have oppression. And it's not true that all men as a group uh, have an objective interest in keeping oppression. Working class men have much more to lose uh, with the existence of oppression and discrimination. It is the capitalist, the, no matter if there are men or women, who have real interest in keeping and upholding the oppression. Oppression is the best weapon for these capitalists to divide the working class, to make workers fight each other rather than to fight in the root cause uh, of oppression and exploitation, capitalism and class society. For example, they try to divide the working class on examples and questions like the right to abortions, which has been under attack in many different countries. The capitalists, you know, the most rabid conservatives and so on, they try to justify this attack by saying that oh, abortion is a blow against religion, it's a blow against the family, it's a, you know, a threat to male workers' dominance within the family. And they use this to pit one part of the working class against um, another, making workers who do support the right to abortion align themselves with liberal capitalists and liberal politicians 
who claim to you know, support it, obviously they never do, and to make uh, these workers not just see the conservative politicians as enemy, but also conservative workers as, um, uh, as, as enemies. And the same thing with conservative workers, to make them see that women's rights, but also other things like same-sex marriage, trans rights, as a threat towards themselves and the family. And by having workers aligning themselves with one part of the capitalist wing uh, against another sector of the working class, it stops them from seeing who their real class enemy is. And this is what all capitalists want. No matter if they are liberal conservatives, culture war hinders a united struggle against capitalism uh, when in reality, both wings of the capitalists want to attack workers' conditions. Now, oppression is obviously as well very profitable for capitalism. Capitalist society requires different groups who are paid different amounts that can act to bring down the overall level of workers' conditions and wages. Uh, with the existence of a group who is generally seen as inferior, it can be also justified to pay them lower, uh, give them poorer conditions, and a so-called unskilled worker can therefore also be used to threaten a male worker. You know, if you are too much trouble, we will replace you with a woman, for example. Um, so the argument that men as a group has an interest in keeping women's oppression uh, working class men is completely wrong. Uh, they have much more to win in a united struggle for common interest as it will help to raise the conditions and working um, condition and living condition for all. Now competition between workers is therefore always encouraged by the ruling class and the representatives, for an, uh, forcing women to work part-time as well as having greater responsibility within the family is also very useful for the ruling class. It allows greater competition and at the same time producing the next generation of the working class. And there are different mechanisms within capitalism to ensure that women are forced to do most of the domestic work. Since women earn less than men generally, family benefits from the fact that it is women who work part-time or take longer parental leave. Um, as long as women are paid less than men, you can't just force men to take as much uh, childcare as men because it could be a financial punishment for families with low income. And many feminists, they don't understand this because they believe that the reason why men don't want to stay home with their children is just because a consequence of gender uh, norms and so on. Uh, but for working class family, it could be an economics issue. Um, employers are also aware of the risk that women at a certain age might want to have children, which makes it more difficult for women at a certain age to get a full-time job uh, or to be promoted, which in then in, you know, helps to withhold women's wages. So capitalists, they don't have an interest whatsoever in paying men and women equally. Um, the capitalists make huge profit out of this inequality. And the reason that men and women don't share domestic work equally is not just a matter of gender roles and norms. It's a consequence of the economic structure that is inherent within uh, capitalism. And these structures give men and women roles in society, which in turn you know, maintain these norms of, of men and women. And capitalism, they rely on these gender norms uh, and the family because uh, the task of, of uh, caring for children, elderly, cooking, cleaning, is something that has to be done within uh, society to function. And the main role for the family in capitalism is to ensure that there is a new generation of workers to be born so the capitalists can exploit them in the future. So as long as the family exists as an institution where women are becoming financially depending on a man, not only narrow gender roles will continue to exist, but violence and sexual harassment, which is a consequence of, a, of, of power that, that men has over women. Now, the key to liberate uh, women is to free her from the family and allow her to participate in the governance of society. To make her financially independent, she must be put under the same conditions as a man in production, 
with the same working condition and salary, with the right to work full-time if she wished to. If a woman wants to divorce or raise children of her own, it should not be a financial loss for her. And to free women from the family, we must liberate her completely from the unpaid domestic work. However, these domestic tasks still need to be carried out. We can't just stop doing dishes uh, or whatever. But the solution would be for society to take care of these tasks. Um, however, clearly, that would only be possible if we had a socialist society run on the basis of needs rather than profit. It would not, after all, be profitable to have free, uh, high-quality canteens uh, for everyone under capitalism. But this does not mean that Marxists, you know, have to wait to fight oppression until the socialist revolution. We would fight for any reform that would benefit oppressed groups and working class, such as uh, better working conditions, equal pay, uh, for more housing, for more women's shelter, better and free healthcare, childcare, education, better conditions for parents, etc. But we had to explain that you can't just simply reform your way out of oppression under capitalism. The overthrow of capitalism is absolutely necessary to get rid of the material basis of uh, oppression. Not simply uh, fight oppression today. We don't do that just because of moral reason, but we also because that we understand that a successful revolution um, requires the unity of the working class. You cannot overthrow capitalism with just one part of the working class participating. And more than this, it is only through mobilizing the working class and prepare them for the overthrowing of capitalism that you can do so by the daily struggle for improvement. Now, although capitalism, we know it cannot liberate uh, women, it has played a progressive role in history. Women joining the workforce has allowed um, you know, us to participate in the class struggle. Capitalism massively developed the productive forces, which has created the resources and the technology that could be used to completely do away with domestic work. Um, and, and feminists, they look at this with horror uh, because they, they, they see history from a moral point of view. Uh, like, how can you say that capitalism is progressive? And they point to the fact that, yeah, oppression has intensified uh, under capitalism. And they argue that, oh yeah, you Marxist, you don't look at history from the perspectives of women, uh, but only through the male proletariat. Like, for example, uh, Silvia Frederici, who is a so-called Marxist feminist, um, she doesn't think that capitalism has played a progressive role. And she claims that Marx only focused on economics and they had a blind spot to women's unpaid reproductive work and sexual divisions of labor in capitalist accumulation. Um, Frederici, she says, I should add that Marx could never have presumed that capitalism paves the way for human liberation had he looked at his history from the viewpoint of women. Now, Marx says we don't look at history from the moral lens. Um, we, the reason why we say something is progressive is because it has moved society forward by developing the productive forces. But that does not mean that we are denying human suffering. Marx says that capital was born dripping from head to foot from every pore with blood and dirt. The point is that capitalism has, through the development of an interconnected economy run by multinational monopolies um, and the creation of the working class, it has created the conditions for socialism in the future. The money and the resources are there to completely erase hunger, poverty, inequality, and scarcity. You can uh, have the capacity to produce enough food, housing, free education, healthcare for everyone. The resources and the technology is there to completely do away with unpaid domestic work. All of this would have a real impact uh, for women's life if these were implemented. But what's stopping us is that workers are not in control of the production. It comes down to the question of private property and who owns the means of production. So the solution is that the working class, which includes all layers of society, uh, of oppressed, um, and, and to, for them to come into power and plan society according to our needs, 
Marx says we don't limit ourselves to what we can fight for under capitalism, but instead we put forward a revolutionary way forward uh, on how we can end oppression altogether. Uh, it is through having a correct understanding of theory and history that you can put forward a program that would completely you know, pave the way for a true liberation of humanity. But feminism, they, they don't have a correct uh, understanding of the origins of oppression, and they end up with strategies that is directly harmful for the struggle. Like Heidi Hartman, she says, women should not trust men to liberate them after a revolution, in part because there's no reason to think that they would know how, in part because there's no necessity for them to do so. In fact, the immediate self-interest lies in continuing the oppression. So the strategy that she's proposing is a separate woman's movement led by all women, no matter what class you belong to. All women should just unite to fight all men. And it opens up this illusion that working class women can trust a female capitalist more than a male uh, worker's colleague. And at the end of the day, the female capitalist will never support the struggle that will truly lead to uh, you know, the end of oppression of women, as it will threaten her profits. They limit themselves to what is achievable for them as individuals. The bourgeois feminists, they are happy to stand on other women to get to the top. And that's why we say we can have no collaboration with the ruling class. At the end of the day, these so-called Marxist feminists, they are reformists. They don't believe that the workers can take power and run society for themselves and by themselves. They don't believe that socialist revolution is achievable or even necessary to bring down the material base for oppression. They limit themselves to what is achievable within capitalism, which is not very much. As capitalism is in its deepest crisis ever, there are no rooms for reforms. What's on the agenda today is counter reforms and attacks on women. And another so-called solution that is being brought up is wages for housework. Silvia Federici, she claims that it's the most revolutionary perspective for women. By demanding wages for housework, it would legitimize um, women's real work uh, instead of being an act of love. Uh, but what it boils down to is moralism. Why are women not paid for the work that we do? Why, why uh, are we not valued as equal as men? Um, but the thing is, she completely misunderstands of how capitalism works and the role of the family within capitalism. And by raising demands of wages for uh, housewives, you actually cement the isolation of women within the family. And the idea that it is, you know, unpaid labor is not actually completely true. Workers' wages, their paid labor, are given to them because uh, the capitalists want them to reproduce themselves. And in a lot of countries where you have larger layer of women uh, being housewives, the men's salaries are also covering their needs within the family. So wages for housework is a reactionary demand and it would not help women to attain more freedom or equality. Now, all of these feminists, they have a lot to say about Marxism not being enough. So let us, track the, um, uh, the, the, let us see the track record. Uh, of what Marxists have achieved when they have come into power, like they did in the Russian Revolution of 1917. Before the revolution, women were treated as property to men. Children, and especially uh, girls, were working in the factories as an average of 12 to 14 years. Uh, often, yeah, they started to do so. And with the outbreak of war, you did see, though, a larger amount of women coming into the workforce. Uh, and this had huge implication for how the revolution unfolded. It is not a coincidence that women often play a leading role in revolutions. And that's the reason because oppressed groups has the most to win if a revolution succeeds, but also the most to lose if it don't. And the Russian revolution is started on the International Workers' uh, Women's Day. And the living condition uh, in 1917, they had become intolerable for, uh, for, for, for women, uh, with the brutal war uh, and the hunger in the city. And women had reached that point to uh, what they could stand. So the women in the textile factories, they went out on strike uh, and they sent out delegation to all of the factories in Petrograd and asked the workers to join them. These demonstrations, they grew into a general strike 
uh, and an insurrection. And five days later, they had overthrown the Tsar. Nine months later, the working class came to power uh, through the Soviet, led by the Bolshevik party. And I, I want to mention what that really meant for women. And it's also important to know that without the unity between men and women within the working class during the revolution, it would have never succeeded. Lenin said this, he said, in Petrograd, here in Moscow, in other towns and industrial centers, the women workers acted splendidly during the revolution. Without them, we would not have been victorious. That's my opinion. How brave they were, how brave they still are. Think of all the suffering and the deprivation they bore. They are carrying on because they want freedom. They want communism. Yes, our proletarian women are excellent class fighters. Now, after getting into power, the Bolsheviks immediately abolished all laws that put women in disadvantage to men. Uh, all the restrictions of freedom uh, of movement was removed and uh, other laws of, of women's uh, equal rights to own lands and function as head of household. Uh, she was given free access to abortion. Registrations of children and marriage was taken out from the control of the church. It now happened just as a simple process uh, that only needed mutual consist. Each partner could take each other's name or keep their own if they wanted to. The walls was made as easy as possible and could be achieved if only one person wanted it. The concept of uh, illegitimate children was abolished. Um, women were given paid maternity leave before and after uh, the birth was introduced. Um, and, and night shifts uh, for preg pregnant women or women who just have become uh, mothers was prohibited. Uh, you had instead an addition of, of special maternity leaves being set up, childcare facilities were advanced, equal pay for work with equal value was established, and equality for the law was just the first step. Now, the question was also to involve the masses into the governance of, of society. So four days after the Bolshevik took power, they introduced the eight hour working day, which is enormously imp uh, important for allowing women to participate in politics. They also set up different educational uh, system to, to, to teach women how to read and write and to draw them into politics. They also attempted to socialize their housework by building communal kitchen, public restaurant, laundries, uh, and to unload the burden on women in the family. And this was the beginning to implement a program that could really create material conditions to allow general, uh, genuine equality. However, the, six, uh, the, the, the successful revolution, there was no successful revolution in West. Soviet Union remained isolated in condition of poverty, low technolo uh, technolo um productive development. Uh, it was subjected to imperialist war, to civil war, to famine. So it's not possible to build socialism in one country, and especially not a country like Russia was in 1917. It requires a very well-developed economy that can afford to expand the welfare and to completely eliminate uh, unpaid domestic work. It also requires a working class that can have the time and education to run society uh, by themselves. And due to all of these setbacks, the mood of the working class became disheartened and the working class could no longer participate in the governance uh, of, of society. And you started to see under these conditions a counter-revolutionary bureaucracy developing around Stalin. And because that they could not move the economy towards socialism, they were unable to fully liberate women instead to uh, defend the position, the, the, the Stalinist bureaucracy they tried to then romanticize the family again um, because they could not keep up with, with, with uh, you know, advancing the welfare. So they had to justify it. Um, they, uh, they, and later on, they removed uh, the right to abortion. They criminalized again homosexuality. Um, and this was predicted by Marx, where he said that when want is generalized, the old crap revives. And with the generation of Soviet Union came the return of, of women's oppression. And it's not because that socialism cannot abolish women's oppression, but it's because the Soviet Union never reached socialism. So when people criticize Marxism, it's often Stalinism that they have in mind, uh, which has of course played a disastrous role uh, to, to the real meaning of Marxism. Uh, but despite the difficulties, Soviet Union was one of the first countries 
that was the most democratic one and has <laughs> achieved more things for women than any other capitalist did. Uh, and the majority of all improvements for women has also been won through revolutionary class struggle. It is not a co coincidence that uh, a, a number of countries were seeing the right to, for women to, to vote uh, just a few years after the Russian Revolution. And it was because of the ruling class were terrified that the workers in their countries was going to revolt and carry out a revolution against them. So they gave concessions. So with that said, let's take inspirations from what the Bolsheviks did in 106 years ago and finish the work that they began.